Okay, so shalom, welcome to the Or Zerua Beit Midrash. We are in Masechet Makot, the continuation of this great part of the Talmud, all about crime and punishment and criminal justice systems and philosophy. We're on uh, Yud Aleph Bet, and what we're going to do is we're just going to remind ourselves that if someone had a sentence that was handed down without a Kohen Gadol, According to the Mishnah, he doesn't get to leave the city of exile. And then that was all kind of within the conversation of the notion, and that's going to be in a Mishnah that's coming, but it was in a conversation that was started because we knew that someone was who was sent to a city of exile was freed upon the death of the Kohen Gadol. There was a Ribui an expansion of what does that Kohen Gadol really mean? Is it the only Kohen Gadol, the one who does the Yom Kippur Avodo in the center of the Beit HaMikdash? Or was it a different kind of Kohen? They use it as a typical moment. They use it as a okay? Hello. I'm just going to ask everybody to mute so that we don't have that again. If you just can mute yourself until you have something to say, that'd be great. Okay, so... Great. So we we have a ribui. It's not just the Kohen Gadol who does this work. It's the Kohanim who are considered like the rank of five-star general. And if one of them dies, then the person who's received the sentence goes free. And then we have this notion of the why behind the Kohen Gadol dying. And that being the reason that someone, so the Gemara said to us as we were as we were learning, that it's because the Kohen Gadol had a responsibility to pray for mercy, pray for mercy in terms of society and the kind of reality that would unfold within a society, the matters of justice and the matters of God's granting the society with some kind of uh, People taking responsibility for each other. And we were concerned that the Cohen wasn't living up to his uh, responsibilities. And we were inside the conversation about taking responsibility for doing your part within society. Remember, we got to a place where uh, there was an instance where, you know, lions and tigers, oh my, last week we, we heard that this whole case where the Cohen didn't pray for someone was compared to the, the, the instance where someone let a lion roam and it, a man was eaten by this ferocious beast at a distance of three parsings from the area where we, Rabbi Hoshua ben Levi could have made prayers and could have organized the public in prayer. And what we said was that was parallel in some way to the Kohen Gadol doing the work from the temple vis-a-vis -vis setting the system in place and teaching the public how to avoid certain amounts of crime or danger being a, a good influence on society. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, by praying, doesn't mean magically that he's going to say, God, stop this, and God says, lion, chess, chess game, move over here. But the public prayer brings people together from the community, makes everyone hyper aware, just like sometimes in synagogue, we're there to say the prayers, but we're also there to collectively worry, share concern, say what's necessary by way of public education or information that needs to be dispersed. And this is the, the notion we get on a very practical level. Yet there's this real sense that both the men who are banished to the city of exile, we're talking about men for the most part, they in their minds at least, um, that they have a power of prayer. They could pray for the death of the Kohen Gadol, the, the mothers of the Kohanim have the what do you call it? Uh, 
But if it's in society where they bring the clothes and the food and they say, you know, please either don't pray for their death or pray that they stay alive. Pray for their lives. Because there, there's a power in prayer. All of that to say that we have further discussion that is about the high priests. And we are going to move into an area where some of that's going to come back. And then there's also going to be other, if you will, Rabbi, you're muted. You're muted. Rabbi, you're Rabbi. muted. Now I'm unmuted. I'm sorry. I'm muted. We can hear you. <laughs> I, I lost you. I lost you. Did you get cut off for a minute? We, you, you the, fra the frame froze, and so, and then we, and you couldn't hear us because we tried right. to tell. Well, you. what happened was is that that I got disconnected from the internet, and the connection looks a little unstable. I have to tell you just from experience. So I'm going to apologize in advance if it happens again, but here we are. Okay. You're back in the Beit Midrash. We're on Yud Aleph. And we just said the Kohanim had a responsibility. We just said they didn't live up to it. They didn't teach the society nor pray for Rahmanis and mercy. And we know that taking that responsibility seriously is, an, is a concern of the Gemara. And we're going to pick up on 11b at Ibayalahu. A dilemma that's raised before the sages. And so I'm going to share the screen. Here comes the text. Here comes the text. Okay. So... Ibailahu Bamitat Kulan Hu Khazer O Dilma Bamitat Echadmehen. So the, it's not just going to deal with the assumption of the Mishnah, it's going to question the assumption of the Mishnah. And that is, it was asked of them, there was a machloket, there was a question. What about this dilemma of the death of all of the high priests enumerated in the Mishnah, that this guy who's sentenced to exile returns, or is it even with the death of one of them that he returns? So in other words, you're seeing a question in the Gemara's layers that's probably left over from a discussion that was about the Mishnah, probably right after the Mishnah, but it was pushed down the line. This is like a, a editorial critical comment. Are you telling me after you teach this Mishnah that it could be a Kohen that was anointed with oil, a Kohen that was anointed by putting the clothes on, a Kohen that was going out to war? Are you telling me that all these guys have to die and then he's freed? Or are you telling me it's just one of them? And so that is... The question that's brought up here, and here's a resolution to the dilemma. Tashma, come in here, come and learn. Now, that's an interesting phrase that the Gemara uses, right? Come, ta, like ba, and shma. Because because the, the, the verb shma and the noun that's made from it, a shma'ata, is a, an oral teaching that was around that likely got put into the textual fabric of the Gemara. So we have a Shma'ata. So Tashma was the name of a journal. And when people wrote about topics that they wanted to explore, uh, they, they wrote in Tashma. Uh, here's where it comes from. It come, it's, a, it's a hermeneutical phrase from the Gemara. And it has a lot of power and a lot of strength. Like, come and, come and, le come and learn. Nigmar dino below Kohen Gadol, eno yotze misham leolam. So the, here's how it's going to be kind of answered. If the verdict of the murderer was decided at a time that there was no high priest at all, he never leaves the city of refuge. And 
Im ita, if there is a Kohen Gadol, the Hidar be bedehanach, bedeleka. And if it's so that the death of any of those listed in the Mishnah facilitates his return, let him return with the death of one of those other high priests, the one who was either sanctified by the vestments, the one who was sanctified to go out to fight the war. So he says, if it's already that one, let it be these other one whom we have in the list. The Gemara rejects the proof. The Mishnah is referring to a case where there were no high priests when the verdict was decided. In other words, oh, there were literally no, there were literally no one there in terms of this question. The Gemara says, well, what if there's none? Then it's La Olam. In other words, you have no Kohenic bureaucracy at the time. So if you have nothing, how are you going to get anybody to get freed from a city of exile? You're not. So for this reason, you needed to keep the priesthood in active form because certain offices can fall by the wayside over the history of the people, right? Let's say that we, we've asked the question before. There was Aharonite priests, priests and there was Tzadikite priests in the Tanakh. Well, what happened in between? Did they forget to have priests? And then they said, wait a minute, we got to get this system back in order, just like they found the book of Deuteronomy. We got to get back to some Torah roots here, right? The, the uh, Josiah reforms. And then the priests are the ones to teach Torah in addition to administer to the sacred precincts and do the rituals. I'm just suggesting that an, uh, an office or, or, or a, a kind of you know, administrative post is not move on my love the only way to do business. When you have Yom Kippur, if you don't have... How do you have Yom Kippur if you don't have a temple? And you don't have the avoda? You have ritual. And so the rabbis replace it by liturgy. And say, if you say the liturgy, it's as if the Kohen Gadol did it. And you have that power now to democratize it. So the we see what it meant, actually, just by that question, to change the approach entirely to the system. Because remember, there are people who argued that we should build the third Beit HaMikdash. And we should have that because, God forbid, we, we won't be able to perform any of the ritual that was appointed for any of these holidays if we don't have the actual korbanos. We don't have the rituals that were appointed in the Mishnah. So was this evidence that there was a gap because they, they raised this? Well, I don't think this is evidence per se, but the, the fact that the Tanakh kind of has this switch over to this other family, I think might suggest that as we develop the Malchut, as we develop the kingdom of Israel, the state apparatus that we had at the time, that we actually reinstituted in a certain way. And they were worried. They were worried also maybe in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back, the priests did their bidding in ritual kind of ways. And then maybe since they didn't have a full out state apparatus with everything like a military and everything like a full out system of education that the priests were involved in. Uh, and they had lost the anointing oil. You know, was it going to go by the wayside or not? And then when it's in the age of the Maccabees, the rabbis here could be actually responding to something a little bit more particular because they're worried that the priesthood is being corrupted by a ruling class of people who are combining the kingship and the Kohanim, which is a different matter of rabbinic politics that could be reflected on these pages that we're talking about the Kahuna so deeply. And so uh, here we have some, some reflection on it. The interesting thing is, is that th this is a little bit like I, su I suggested at first that it was lost to the conversation that might have occurred right after the Mishnah we studied back on page 11a when we talked about Echad Mashuach B'Shemen Amishcha Echad Merube B'Vegadim that was the different type of Kohanim the Mishnah that came before this conversation but here we also might say that it foreshadows the Mishnah to come which may frustrate us by way of a principle within the quote unquote system of uh, criminal law here and that is what what is frustrating if if we put it on the table is that if there's no high priest then the guy never has a chance to be free we just said la olam he has to stay in the city of refuge so i can't answer the question why but we're going to think about whether or not there's a why that comes within the context of the conversations within these pages. And part of the reason why we're, we're continuing along in these Gemaras that we had started last year is to really get to the bottom of some of these assumptions that are in here 
and to hear what is made evidence by the Talmudic conversation that comes around these. So we're on the uh, second So we're on the uh, Mishnah that, that begins Mish and Nigmar. If you're in the uh, Stein Saltz edition with me, I'm going to just flip the page here for those on screen. It's on page 75 in the English. It's the, the Mishnah that starts Mish and Nigmar. It's on page 11b2 in the Schottenstein. Okay, so it says Mish and Nigmar Dino met Kohen Gadol. If the Kohen Gadol died after his sentence to exile was handed down. So his sentence to exile is handed down. Hare ze eno gole. The killer is not exiled to the city of exile. If, however, the Kohen Gadol died before his sentence was handed down, and they appointed another Kohen Gadol in his place, and afterwards his sentence was handed down, he returns from exile upon the death of the second newly appointed Kohen Gadol. So here we, we have the situation where the Kohen Gadol dies after a manslaughter sentence to exile is handed down. That's only the time limit, or it's uh, infinite until the Kohen dies. Because I'm reading this as if what we know, like the sentence will be completed as if it's a. Well, it's a verdict. The verdict is handed down. So between the verdict. Um, you read the word is handed down? Yeah, verdict is handed down by the bench. I, I read that, you know, and ended. No, 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 it's not nigmar like ended. It's it's a legal term. The the bench hands down the, the, the sentence. Okay? He, the priest dies. The priest dies and he's not in exile yet. He's not exiled. As the death of that high priest, what? It basically frees him. The whole concept we learned before was the death of the high priest finishes the exile. But wait a minute. Was he exiled at all? Not literally. So if it was before his verdict was decided that the high priest died, though. So here's the difference. His verdict had not been decided. The high priest dies. They appoint another one in his place. Then what happens the verdict is decided, he's guilty, his sentence is exile, he returns only from that exile with the death of the second high priest, or the new, uh, the new high priest. That's the point. So, if the verdict of a murderer was decided, Nigmar Dino, below Cohen Gadol, if it was decided at the time that there's no Kohen Gadol, here's where we have a repetition of the Gemara we just read before, right before the Mishnah, as if it was the introduction or the foreshadowing. Vahahoreg Kohen Gadol. And by the way, let's throw in an interesting case. The, the, the manslaughter who happens to kill a Kohen Gadol inadvertently. So there's like one of those that sometimes we like to ask those fun questions, like what if this kind of questions? So who says a klutz kasha can't be a Mishnaic question, right? What if this guy was bringing, obviously, like his korban, and the, and the only priest to do the work that day was the Kohen Gadol himself, and he happened to, you know, knock the the this, the, and, and it's manslaughter, and he kills the Kohen Gadol, or, or, or maybe it was a situation outside of the actual avoda, and it wasn't really a ritual moment, but they were both like, you know, walking in this or that pathway. And, you know, God forbid the guy moves one wrong move and a boulder, uh, you know, you you make up whatever the facts of the case are. Haoreg Kohen Gadol, if he kills the Kohen Gadol, in other words, manslaughter, because we're talking about being exiled. The Kohen Gadol Shaharag, and likewise in the case of a high priest 
who unintentionally kills. Eino yotze misham la'olam. All those cases, a person is exiled and he never leaves the city of refuge. So to review quickly. A verdict is handed down by the bench. The high priest dies. Even though the verdict was handed down, first out, first out of the gate in the Mishnah, he's not exiled. The death of the high priest exempted him from the exile. He's freed, right? Because his verdict was handed down. Even though he wasn't there in the city of exile, they say in the Mishnah here, he's freed. Secondly, the, it's before the verdict is actually decided. The court is deliberating on the sentence. We've heard the witnesses. It's before the verdict. The high priest dies. They appoint another one. He returns from exile only after the appointment of the second one. It didn't matter that the first one was the high priest at the time that they heard the case. And then, if the verdict of a murder was decided at a time there was no high priest, or he unintentionally killed the high priest, or the high priest unintentionally kills, and they all have to be exiled, they're exiled to the city of refuge, no chance that they're freed. They're there forever. I guess it seems fair. Well, that's, yeah, exactly. We're going to say that. We're going to say, wow, fairness? What kind or what kind of system is that? That's a different way to ask questions about this, right? We could either say, that's not fair. And we could, or we could ask, what kind of system are we really talking about? What is underneath all this? Why do we have situations where someone, the olam, someone forever, is not freed from the city of exile? And it's a very interesting question. So far, we have no why. We can't answer. We have a mission. We have a tradition. We're seeing if we get any hint as we go forward. And here we have this paragraph and the one who exiled may not leave the city at all. And now let's talk about the status of a guy who's sitting in exile. And I need him. I'm a lawyer. Remember, we've had debates about whether they're real lawyers or not, but okay. I, I'm a guy, I have a case in front of the Beit And I need my friend, who was just exiled to the city of refuge, to actually testify in my case. And my case is about a mitzvah, my case is about a monetary or a civil matter. My case is a criminal case, and I need him to testify for me. Ain't no yotze. He doesn't go out. He's not allowed out of that city. Why, by the way, if we had to answer very quickly, if he's outside the city limits, it's legal for the blood avenger to actually kill him. We're very worried about that. Even if the Jewish people require his services, Yisrael ben and even if he's the general of the army of Israel, like Yoav ben Suria, even if he's got this high rank and he accidentally killed and he's in exile, we don't say, you have special treatment, Yoav. For you, we're going to let you out to go testify in this court case. He never leaves the city of refuge. Shinemar, as we say, or as it's written, Shinemar is the, ver the, the word, the passive verb, as it is written, or as it's said in this case, because it could be Nichtab, it could be Neymar, Neymar, we have a Pasuk, Asher Nas Shama. The Pasuk in Numbers 35, which we're familiar with, which is the section of Torah about the cities of refuge, it says, and he fled there. That is, he is there to stay. Sham Tehe Dirato. There, that's where he dwells. That's where he lives. Sham tehe mitato, that's where he dies. Sham tehe kavurato, there shall be his burial. Now that's a whole interesting other aspect because there are going to be some discussions about some of those assumptions. It didn't say that you should have that be a place where he dies. It didn't say that the place where he's buried because what do I know about the potential of his being exiled there? 
if there's a Kohen Gadol at the time of his sentence, that he could be freed. So that's a, that's a different issue. And there are some questions about that that come up in the Mepharshim right away. But the, the notion that you can't leave for such matters as Edut Mitzvah, Edut Mamon, or Edut Nifashot, nif that that, that's a little, that's interesting too. Because in, in the sense of developing criminal law and in the sense of developing incarceration and, and our policies about incarceration, you maybe you've even seen this sometimes in television or movies, and I've been actually in courtrooms where it's happened. They bring a guy and they ask him all the time in cross-examination, have you made a deal with the prosecutor in order to be a witness in this trial? You know, and he's sitting there in a jumpsuit and he's got his handcuffs still. And, you know, people are making assumptions about his testimony. And sometimes they they take off the handcuffs and they take off the jumpsuit and the guy, you know, takes a shave and he's actually a different kind of witness. And you don't know from anything that he's actually a prisoner serving two life sentences concurrently, by the way. And, he, but we need him, right? But we need him. So it depends on different policies. Different states have different statutes. One of the, I'm not going to get into the whole reading that I did this week, but I was, I was interested to know because sometimes when we're in the gym, Yona and I start talking about things. And so there's a guy in my building who's a prosecutor in the Bronx who has a lot of interesting perspective for us when it comes to these Gemaras that we're learning. And so he he's fascinated too, because he says, really, people actually debate about these things for fun. <laughs> I said, well, it's not even just for fun. It's to be a better citizen, you know? And he says, that's pretty interesting because not, not that I don't like talking about it in the gym, but talking about it like this is very different than my daily work. Then I can't imagine people are debating, you know, manslaughter, accidental death. He's the one that told me about the distinctions in New York's code about manslaughter and accidental death. Mela, here in the Mishnah, there are some very interesting differences state to state about who can testify in courts of law as a prisoner in the system. And it's just fascinating to think about whether or not prosecutors can actually reach into the pool of those incarcerated in order to bring them forward to actually testify within a court, within a criminal case or within a within a civil case. And within, uh, a, well, we don't do mitzvah cases in American law, but can you imagine if they had cases about mitzvahs and whether or not someone really fulfilled a, a mitzvah and they impaneled some some, uh, base, some some bate din? Very interesting question as to whether or not I can like, you know, charge somebody for not fulfilling this mitzvah or not. That, that's also a whole different story. And there's some interesting fiction about pressing charges and holding people uh, uh, responsible for those kinds of things. Everything from like an Elie Wiesel bringing God to court for the, the greatest disaster of the Holocaust, right? That, but that trope in literature is not unfamiliar to Jews way back when, when we bring people and even put God on trial for, for doing mitzvahs. We actually studied about some of that when we read Avodah Zarah. That was a literary trope within the first chapter of Masechet Avodah Zarah, if you remember, who's on trial. The Jewish people are watching God try the nations of the world, but then the tables turn, right? And God turns to the Jewish people, and it seems like we're the ones prosecuting the rest of the nations, but really God's cross-examining us about whether or not we did the mitzvahs that, are, that we're obligated to do. And so th this, is, this is an interesting kind of trope. But what's, um, what's further about that is that in this Mishnah, um, we have some commentary. There's a there's a commentary. It's a little bit after. I think it's a more bordering between the Achronim and the and the modern era, and it's about what really happens with someone who's in exile, who faces like this. Made them think of questions like, "Wait a minute, are you saying that a guy in exile can't go to the Beit Hamikdash to offer the korban Pesach? Because if you don't offer the korban Pesach, you're entirely cut off. You have kari. It carries a penalty of being entirely cut off from the people. So, how do we deal with letting someone come out of their exile? Did we have a system for leading them all and keeping them protected from those blood avengers who might feel like it's a field day?" And they're waiting, you know, like, oh, Korban Pesach is coming. Let's all like, lie in wait here. 
and see if we can take care of business while they're out because then we're not liable for the for the death of this guy he's actually put himself in such a place but so how do they deal with all that so some of these questions got very creative halakhically and what this Cheshik Shlomo came up with in terms of a commentary is that it says, Ein yotze misham, meaning that if I take someone out to be a witness in a trial, because most likely it did happen that people who were in cities of exile were taken for trials, according to this one commentary, it means that that's not the end of their sentence. That even though they appeared in court, that they have to go back there. And that's really what the mission is talking about. Eino Yotze means a permanent release of these people. But if I need them for the case, I might be able to include them. Uh, and so, you know, questions of their trustworthiness or not, you know, what kind of vested interest do they have? These are all things that uh, we have to consider. But I think it's not like today's sometimes pushing into the, to the pool of prisoners. Okay, and then the, la the last part of the Mishnah, and then I'll stop for a little bit of your reflections and questions. Kashem ir koletet kach techuma kolet. The Mishnah goes on to say, let's talk about the area of the city and the kind of uh, uh, reference back to the blood avenger system, because we're still trying to grapple with how this all washes out with the blood avenger and the blood avenger system. And so you see that the Mishnah is not completely letting go and under, and it's not rewriting entirely. The blood avenger system is trying to deal with what the Torah still leaves open, that the blood avenger will have no liability if he finds the guy outside of the area of the city. Just as the city is the place where there's absolutely no touching the guy who's in exile, so too, the actual outskirts of the city, located within the Shabbat boundary, as uh, the Steinsaltz explains. The Tachum, generally the word Tachum, in the Mishnah will deal with a Shabbat Tachum. And that is an area that you can travel into and up to and still be within your Sabbath precinct. You must stay within that precinct for Shabbat. Rotseach sheyatsa chutz letachum but a, a person who was sentenced to exile and goes outside of that boundary, umetzao goel hadam, and the blood avenger actually finds him. Rabbi Yossi Galili Omer, Rabbi Yossi the Galilite Omer, mitzvah beyad goel hadam, that he still has a mitzvah then the blood avenger to actually avenge the blood in his family, and and no liability befalls him. Or a shoot beyad kol hadam, and by the way it then even goes to anybody in the in the countryside here who may take on the responsibility that the blood avenger has. Now, this is a transfer of responsibility that seems really, really like it's going the other direction. It's going backwards. System was supposed to come and help us alleviate the potentials that there would be a lot of blood vengeance. We even tried to convince the Blood Avenger on the way with two sages escorting the person to the city of refuge, remember? We had a built-in system where society protected these people on their way. We had roads that were clearly marked. We had guards that used to go with them, sheriff's deputies, the chachamim that were appointed. This was part of the jobs of the sages. But kol adam, anybody from society could come and do what was considered to be, and by the way, he says, urashut, permission to do the mitzvah of blood vengeance was given him. Rabbi Akiva Omer, but Rabbi Akiva says, Rashut biyad goel hadam, it is only permissible to the goel hadam, to the blood avenger. Here is the development of the system. It's permissible, meaning we say theoretically about the blood avenger, that in fact, if he followed through with the blood vengeance, he wouldn't be liable. But now we make everyone liable to murder if they try to take care of the problem. So whereas maybe this reflects an ancient Galilee system, meaning the Galilee, where they had, yes, he was from the Galilee. So so maybe when, when, when I look at Mishnah, I'm thinking and I'm channeling one of my teachers who used to say that the Tanaim of the Mishnah have to be looked at 
within their local precincts and how things developed locally. And the Galili approach can be contrasted to Rabbi Eliezer ben Herkinus's academy. Rabbi Kiva was a student of Rabbi Eliezer. And by the way, there, there's some stuff fraught with Akiva and Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua in our coming Gemaras. This is a little foreshadowing too that we're going to get to the academy of, of Rabbi Eliezer and we're going to get to the uh, whole notion of Akiva and what role he plays over there. But in this instance, you see that Akiva has a development, e even a, a, a way to rewrite the actual laws that might have been on the books by some tradition in the Galilee, if you want to take it that direction. You don't have to. You could just say that there were two different and distinct understandings by the Tanaitic Academy as it moved from Yavne to the rest of the places where the Tanaim moved in order to really bring the Sanhedrin outside of Jerusalem and bring the Mishnah to life by the year 200, and that they actually had this machloket. Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Yossi Aglili are two different opinions named in the Mishnah for that reason, it creates in and of itself like a little bit of a Gemara hermeneutic. And Rabbi Kiva answers Rabbi Yossi Aglili in this sense. And instead of a Tashima, instead of a, let me prove to you otherwise, by Rabbi Kiva arguing with Rabbi Yossi Aglili, you don't have that kind of editorial framework within the Mishnaic text itself. And you could say, though, that since it sits there one after the other, it is an answer to that kind of image. It within within the framework of the art of legal reasoning, right? So it's Rabbi Yosef Galili says, no, this is how it's understood. And Rabbi Akiva says, no, that's not how we understand it any longer. So you're saying that it is reflecting the region's acknowledged approach, but would it not be that this is one person's take and the other person's take and it's not really... Uh, you know, an accepted practice that it is his point of view, Yosei Hagalini's? If you, if you think of the Mishnah as just a collection of legalisms and, and, and code, and you say it's just a collection, then you can go that route. And that is one option. Goldsmith says that volume called Essential Papers on the Talmud and the Mishnah. He, he, he's one of the first to start thinking through, what is the Mishnah? This is just a collection, right? But if I look at it a little differently, and I and I look at it in two di different ways. One is that it's one region's approach to the law, second region's approach to the law. That's not just a collection. That is, you'll see how Galili is telling you what goes on in the Galil, and Akiva is telling you what goes on near Jerusalem in his lifetime. Third way is that Yossi Galili is brought, and Rabbi Akiva answers him Talmudically and says, I think the law has changed since you're, you've opinion, you 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 you've ruled, and so it depends on how we read the Mishnah, and what our approach is to learning this. You know, is it is it the application of a certain law of blood vengeance as we know it's a mitzvah from the Torah, and then a development or or not? So, three different ways, let's say, that we could understand the Mishnah. Other thoughts, uh, questions before we go on? We've just learned the Mishnah. Ron. I have a problem uh, uh, understanding why they compare a simple Israelite to when the, there is no Kohen and Zardinon Itan to somebody who killed the Kohen Gadol or a Kohen Gadol who killed. The, it's not his problem that the system didn't install a Kohen Gadol. So I don't know why he has the same never be released from uh, Ir Miklat like the other two, which is uh, a symbolism. You know, somebody killed the Kohen Gadol is like somebody killed the king or Kohen Gadol that kills somebody that that's, that doesn't show well about the whole society. So uh, I don't understand why this simple Israelite should have the same... Uh, punishment, so to speak, like those two. Well, as a matter of fact, I think it works the other way. The Kohen Gadol who kills inadvertently is treated like the Israelite in the sense that we just learned 
from this Mishnah that everybody's equal under the law. It's actually an, an interesting statement about equality under the law. Now we don't we 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 also heard that the general Yoav ben Surya is also treated equally under the law. So we have Kohanim, we have military men, and we have Israelites who seem to be all put in the same boat. And uh, th that's an interesting assertion, right? That is a very progressive assertion within the framework of, of law. I'm reading it the way Ron is, and, and that is, in fact, it's not equal because somebody who inadvertently killed the Kohen Gadol, even if there was a Kohen Gadol at the time he's sentenced, still has no chance of getting out. And similarly, a Kohen Gadol who inadvertently killed, and by the time he's sentenced, that there's a new Kohen Gadol, he also no doesn't have the same rights as anyone else who had been in that situation. Uh, so I, I think these two are being very clearly uh, punished at a, a much higher level than the others. But maybe I'm not... Who's thinking. the two being punished at higher levels? One who inadvertently killed a Kohen Gadol or a Kohen Gadol who inadvertently killed, he does not leave there ever. But there, there's nothing that says that they're in the same death. situation of having been having their sentence finalized without there being a Kohen Gadol. The way it reads in English is that it's this or one who inadvertently killed a Kohen Gadol or a Kohen Gadol who inadvertently killed. So those individuals clearly are being punished more severely than someone who was not in either of those two situations. Well, people, let's put it this way. There's a more severe punishment. That is, you'll never be freed from exile. Right. Who are the people who are never freed from exile? They just went through these three cases. Right. So there, you could be a Kohen Gadol and never be freed. You could be a Stam Israelite and never be freed. But the, the reason for it is totally different. Than so, what what reasons do you even see? I don't see. I don't know that I even see reasons. Well, the reason that there is no Kohen Gadol, Israelite, is just unlucky that there happens to not be a Kohen Gadol when he gets sentenced. Okay, the other two are going forever regardless of whether or not there was or was not a Kohen Gadol at the time of their sentencing. So, so which is harsher? Never being able to get out. Never being able to get out equalizes it all. No, no, but it doesn't because if I'm an Israelite and it turns out that there is a Kohen Gadol when I get sentenced, I can get out. But these guys can't get out no matter what. Even if there was a Kohen Gadol at the time they're sentenced. That's my reading of it. Oh, 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 so you're saying that that's harsher for the Kohen Gadol. Uh, yeah, and uh -huh. for the Kohen Gadol killer. Uh -huh. So if I don't read it exactly like that, because I'm going to do the legal reasoning back towards the uh, adjudication of the matters of the first section of the Mishnah. If it's the Kohen Gadol and his verdict is handed down, and a second is appointed. It's at the death of the next appointment that he gets out. So, so that's the only that's the only distinction I'm seeing in, in the way that I was thinking about the Mishnah, since the Mishnah set it up that there's a possibility of making a rectification to actually get anyone who's sentenced low lum freed at the time that the Kohen Gadol dies, if you will. So, if, right. if I'm if I'm disqualified because I'm a criminal as a Kohen Gadol, but they immediately appoint the next Kohen Gadol, I'm imagining based on the first part of this Mishnah. That I'm going to actually be able to get out. It's like the fourth one. Oh, but it, that's not what it's it's not, it doesn't say it explicitly, but since the Mishnah mm -hmm. moved in with that narrative, that's 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 what I that's what I'm that's what I'm sensing. But I hear you. I hear you. It's a possible read of the Mishnah that goes the other direction. And, you know, I think it's it's I think it's also two interesting warnings. One is if you're going to swing an axe around the Kohen Gadol, <laughs> you better be really, really careful. 
And if you're a Kohen Gadol, you have a special level of responsibility to be a role model and to protect against inadvertent killing. So, I mean, I can generate, uh, you know, a societal uh, interest, shall we say, in making these more, uh, you know, more stringent uh, penalties. So uh, that's, that's it. That's it. Excellent. Excellent. Richard. Well, of course, the underlying question is, why is the Cohen Gadol, whether he is li the currently alive or not alive, replaced, in the set, why is the Cohen Gadol involved in this at all in determining the sentence? Right. So, the so, so last week, they answered it in one way. He didn't pray for mercy. And that's the only why we have so far. Do you have another? Did you think of another potential reason based on what we've studied? Didn't pray for mercy. The Kohen Gadol. I, mean, I don't have another answer yet. As an educator, as a potential bureaucratic like member of society and who has the responsibility to engage society, right? As an educator, I can think that this is a commentary on what kind of education do they really have, but it's also a commentary on the Chachamim and their education system when they have to send out two guys who are, who are like sheriff deputies instead of proactive educators on the get-go that say, you've got to make sure that, and we've talked about this, either your axe is better secured, your axe head is better secured to your handle, a la OSHA, or uh, you have responsibility to make sure that you uh, really run this kind of a city of exile in a way that brings people back to feeling like they could make tshuva and finally get atonement. And by the way, maybe we're going to have a limud, right? Who who wouldn't want, since we we do so much Torah learning and rereading, who wouldn't want to reread that the death of the Kohen really means, you know, the Yom Kippur sacrifice the sixth year that you're you're paying your sentence like some it seems like there should be some creative read as to what the death of the Kohen Gadol could be substituted with right we do a lot of hachlafa within the so I'll start to get creative about some of what I don't see in 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 the Talmudic literature I think sometimes you have to you know go one direction versus another in fighting the disease Right? There's got to be a, an alternative way to, to think about that. So I don't know. And we're still in the why. Well, yeah, Richard, to follow up. Yeah, yeah, just follow up to saying, but it even makes it more, even with that explanation, that's the calling that Dole didn't, didn't do his proper due diligence of, to his, to his uh, but even with all of that, it wouldn't explain then, but okay, so there isn't one at the time of sentencing. That's a factor. <laughs> it, 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 it makes it very difficult to bridge that. I only heard, I once heard, it just came to me, I once heard an explanation that it, which was always difficult for me to follow, but maybe it wasn't, I mean, to, to appreciate, but that there was somehow, and I think you may have been alluding to this, that there was somehow a balance in the universe that was upset by this, and somehow, with the Cohen Gadol dying, it sort of made up for a lot of these things in some strange sense. Look, we we we, we talked about that last year already when we were just first uh, uh, exposed to this idea, and I for sure said that you know some people who believe in the more cosmic balance kind of approach, it seemed to make sense. The death of the Kohen Gadol is going to, we're going to mention it right now with the beginning of this Gemara, it's going to somehow achieve atonement for people, meaning there's, you know, the first of all, there's slicha, there's a forgiving of the person, and then atonement is like getting your full pardon and your release, right? So that's the kind of idea here. And for whatever, for whatever you want to say, say it's not that though, say it's not cosmic balance. You know, here's another one that I, that I, I continue to think about as we, we learn this Gemara together. Perhaps uh, different Kohenic administrations ratified or didn't ratify 
this law. And since you you were caught at a time that no one actually uh, represented a a, a Kohenic leader who said that no, this law stays on the books. That you, you're caught in limbo, and for that reason, you know you see the pitfalls of legal systems that are dependent on individual leaders who have to ratify laws, like when kings made codes, you know, when it wasn't a legal code that existed. So maybe it's a lesson in the ineffective ways that laws are represented by codes of certain priests uh, in certain societies, especially when there weren't kings around to decree them. I, Again, just surmising, never never a passage that said that yet. Okay, so where are we? Uh, Ari, did you have a hand? No, Ron, you had a hand. Yeah, it used to be, even in America, by the end of a term of the president, he gave pardons. So, and it used to be through history that new king or old uh, judge or whatever, when they die or when they're end of the term, they give pardon, and that's basically the system. By the it's way, you, something... you can follow the pardon monitor and see that it's not only at the end of the terms. Those are politically expedient ones. Uh, throughout certain terms of presidencies, there have been more or less pardons. It's a whole interesting category of how the law of the presidency is wielded. Uh, so yes, I'm saying that as a leftover, if you get caught without one to quote unquote pardon you, then maybe this is kind of like one of those ways in the early system of pardons that wasn't so worked out so well that it was really faulty. And so that's a, that's a good parallel. Thank you for that. Uh, Shelly. I have a question on a whole different issue, and that is what what were the uh, cities of refuge like? What were the conditions are there? Were there certain laws saying what they had to look like, what they had to contain, what they... Uh, oh, it, We've read we've read in the Gemara over over time that okay. they were dynamic places with Yisraelim, Leviim, Kohanim, people in exile, their teachers for Torah, marketplaces, and the like. They were cities, a little bit more like refuge cities and places to live than they were like pens or penitentiaries or incarceration situations. And so I want to leave it at that because we studied a bunch of different passages over here. To, to describe them a little bit more, but all of that that I just mentioned, imagine all that coming into focus and that it's a consistent place to live. Uh, I wondered how many people wanted to just stay where they made their where they made their lives and not return to their ancestral little village after they were part of these cities. And so <laughs> a very interesting question as to the draw of these places if you're going to build them up and and they're going to start all kinds of businesses and Torah academies. Thank you. Um, Bobby and then Barry, Barry, then Bobby, you guys, you know. So one wonders if the family members can come, could they visit them? You know, was this a real separation from family to start like a different life? So that, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like the, the, the boundaries were permeable back when we studied some of that and that family could indeed visit. That's how, that's how what, what, what the Gemara made me feel. So troubling to me is the Galilee, the, you know, whatever his name is, Hagalilee. Yossi Hagalilee. Yossi Hagalilee. That's, that's like counter to the whole concept. The whole concept is that you give some protection and you acknowledge that this was, um, you know, not, uh, what's the word? It's uh, unintentional. Um, and this sounds very cruel and revengeful. And you're going to have people who were, Ganging up in this revenge? Yeah, that's why I love reading Rabbi Kiva as an answer to Rabbi Yossi Haglili in this case. He said, you are interpreting this in such a way that's going to promulgate this whole system that we are now trying to revise. And so I read, I like to read Rabbi Kiva. And again, we, we're not, we are, we are receivers of this Mishnah text. And we don't know exactly at that level of production what exactly they were thinking and saying. But I think Rabbi Kiva is a response to Rabbi Yossi Haglili. I think it's disturbing that Rabbi Yossi uh, suggested it. Well, it's uh, acceptance of a cultural norm within the ancient Near East. And we don't have to accept that vis-a-vis -vis our own sense of justice issues. But we know deeply that it was reflected in texts of the ancient Near East all the way through and up to 
uh, folks trying to work out their idea, ideas about the Mishnah. Now, uh, ideas about the Torah in the Mishnah. Mind you, multiple wives were, were, were accepted. And the Jewish community, what? Was among the foremost in not having multiple wives during the Talmudic age. So that's not necessarily true in the Mizrahi Jewish communities, in the Babylonian Jewish communities that were still around, in the Yemenite Jewish communities that were still around, you know? So we have developments of certain legal institutions and institutions that seem like not the exact preferential ones that we would go with in our life and times over ages. You know, Rabbi Gershon's Takana about not marrying more than one woman happens, you know, a thousand years after the rabbinic period. Even for Ashkenazim who are displaced, maybe some displaced non-Ashkenazim. And, you know, so I think that Human beings are, you know, reticent to let go of certain kind of assumed legal institutions. Frankly, I think there's more vengeance mindedness seeping into the very fibers of American commun community than ever before. And that's that's part of the deep problem uh, in, in what we see going on, sitting back a little bit as Jews, uh, as we might, thinking about. Torah and what it really created and what even the the you know I would say with with respect for those who see the compassion in it and the mercy within it you know the 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 the, the New Testament displaces the Old Testament the the New Covenant versus the old and then the rewrite of scholars who need to redeem Ishmael and uh, see how poorly he's treated within the Tanakh instead of looking at it as a text that says a little Musa here like, if that's how you're going to treat somebody, you need to revise it. So we're honest about our human inclinations, but we learn from that, how to be better moral actors in the world, right? So when you read with that openness and that mind and that heart, you have a different approach than the tribalisms and the divisiveness and the vengeance that comes along with it. So uh, I, I think it's, a unfortunately, in the you know, in our in our human consciousness, something we have to continue to grapple with, and this lets us grapple with it. You know, text on the table. We we should be uncomfortable with a Yossi Hagalili who says, "Oh, uh, definitely the the blood avenger should do his business, and every person in the community could take care of it for him." That's no way to go forward. Rabbi Kiva says, and thank God we we really do hold up Rabbi Kiva as you know, really being a great student of all these sages, who then helps us on our way. So I, I just want to offer one uh, additional possibility. Speak a little louder so that people can yeah. hear you. In the mic. So I want to offer one additional possibility, because uh, I've always thought of Moses' story as the parallel to this when he, uh, he kills the Egyptian, he goes off to uh, he, the Midianites, and then God calls him back. And God calls him back immediately after we're told that the Pharaoh died. Uh, and so I think there's a, a very interesting parallel there. Then Moses still is not eager to go back. And to assuage his concern, God specifically says to him, the people who wanted to kill you were no longer alive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I've always then in, interpreted the death of the Kohen Gadol as sort of a surrogate for when the, the tempers of the blood avengers are likely to have calmed down. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not perfect because sometimes the Kohen Gadol will die very soon thereafter, and sometimes right, exactly. maybe, but this way at least creates the normalization the way it did in 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 the Moses story. Well, it's the same way, frankly, I think on that level. I think it's a little bit of emotional immaturity, but it assumes that once I oust that guy, or once those people are dead, or once that guy's out of office, everything's all right. And I can get on with my life. But we know. And, yeah. and, and we know from that feeling. But it's not okay. Because there's a lot to still fix. And there's a lot of mess. And there's less people serving. 
and there's an undermining of the local force that you need and numbers right. of people doing the, you know. So I think part of it is getting away from that system. But that's not to say, I, I agree with you in a certain sense, because Moses is the, you know, the, the, the keystone for this whole arc or arch of justice that is created with the Kohenic system. And he's the one who points the Aaronites and he's doing the teaching. Yeah. And he's the one who even near his death is really concerned about getting the cities of refuge up. Uh, you know, as he approaches his death, he really wants the three cities on, you know, on, on the west side and the three cities, and he wants to make sure about that. And right, he's right, even right. putting for the future the possibility okay. of more cities. Yeah, and this is, by the way, some argument within the Gemaras that we've read so far. What were there three before there were six? Did Joshua really get them up and running? And did Moses not see that through? So yeah, I mean, and then there were 42 plus the six. Right. But so, he's but Moses, even to the time right up yeah. to his death, this is a preoccupation yeah. of his. So I think I think it plays on that. Piece. That's great. That's great. And uh, and I think that we've got a there is a lot of emotional attachment to that. But as you mentioned, the problems come when it's the death that happens too soon or thereafter, or right when the verdict is given and he's not there. And now the mission is getting us into some of those weeds. And we, we really have we really have this next little passage in the Gemara that's going to try to get at some more of what's really going on here. What and uh, what kind of statement are we going to make about the death of the Kohen Gadol, Gemara? 11b3 in the Schottenstein, uh, sharing the screen with the Gemara. Okay, so it's on page 75 at the bottom, if you've got the Schottenstein edition. My Tama. So what's the reasoning for all this? I'm a Rabaye. Abaye is going to bring you a Kalvachomer. It's an a for sure argument. Uma mi shigala kvar yetse akshav. If one who's already exiled now goes free, mi shalogala eno din shaloyigle, isn't it logical or doesn't it emerge that with the death of the high priest with regard to his one who's not yet exiled? Isn't it right that he should not be exiled? Yeah. The Gemara, though, doesn't like the reasoning. Or perhaps, Vadilma, might you say to that kind of logic, Ha Degala e Kaperle, the fact that he was exiled, this served to provide atonement. Ha de Logala. But the fact that he was never exiled in the first place, lo, couldn't you say that there's no atonement that's actually engaged, embraced, provided? Mi de galut kamekapra? It asks, is it the exile that really atones for his crime? Oh, like it's a saying, or is it mi tatkayin hu de mechapra? Or is it the actual death of the Kohen Gadol that is mechaper, that really atones for his sin? So if I go back and I do say, you know, whether it's the Moses roots of it all, like Barry suggested, or it's not the mosaic roots, whatever roots I'm stemming or I'm working from, it's not the actual exile, because that's not what really creates the atonement. It's the death of the high priest. So it's only right that the Mishnah, according to that Kava Chomer, should really rule that if the verdict is given and the death of the high priest happens, the atonement's granted. And therefore the guy goes free. 
The Mishnah teaches, Im ad lo shalo nigmar dino. The Mishnah teaches that if it was before his verdict was decided that the high priest died, and they appointed another in his place, and then the verdict is decided, he returns, in other words, he's freed with the death of the second high priest. In other words, the one who comes after the one who died. So now I have a new high priest, and it's with his death that I'm going to be freed because I definitely was exiled physically to the city of refuge after there's a new appointment. Amar of Kahana. Rav Kahana says about the about that case. De Amar Kra Vyashav Ba Admoda Kohen Hagadol Asher Mashachoto Bashemina Kodesh. Rav Kahana explained it's derived from this verse. And he shall dwell there in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest, whom he anointed with the sacred oil. Now, is it the unintentional murder who anoints the high priest? That is, no, referring to obviously the high priest who is anointed during his days after he committed the unintentional murder and after the verdict even, was handed down. So long as they appointed this second high high priest. And so if, if it wasn't that the verdict was already given and the high priest was appointed, he does go there. Now, the question on that is, okay, why the second high priest vis-a-vis -vis this guy who's sent into exile why does he have to wait for that second high priest? What's the difference between if his verdict was given or if his verdict wasn't given? Right? He was on trial for it. He was found guilty. Let's say he's found guilty. The verdict isn't handed down. The sentence isn't completely handed down. So why should he wait? My Havale Lamevat. Why is his home? his return, his freedom, dependent on the death of the second high priest. Because earlier, it explained that the when the first high priest dies, and we just heard in the Gemara just before this, that the death of a high priest affects atonement. So wouldn't we say that this new high priest was appointed only after all of this murder and the trial took place? Don't tell me exactly when the verdict was handed down and then the sentence was handed. If this guy dies, the high priest dies, right after my trial, when the murder had happened, you know, X number of weeks ago, let's say, isn't that the high priest that's really connected to the crime? And wouldn't we say that it's that first high priest whose death would atone? In this case, for this guy. So it says, And it says, no, here's why it's really giving you this now new connection to the second appointed high priest. Because this new high priest is the one who needs to die to affect the atonement. Because he should have davened from the court to have mercy on the guy, and he didn't, and he didn't make that bakasha within his tfilot. So the second high priest now is also, like the first high priest, guilty of continuing a system that is, let's call it, not really effectuating true justice within society. You got to speak loudly because the yeah. microphone is following this reasoning. This undercuts the argument that it's the high priest's death because the high priest wasn't a good teacher. Because the high priest who wasn't a good teacher to prevent this from occurring is already dead. So then and now we're substituting another high priest who had nothing to do with being the high priest and failing to educate. So I, if, if the way this reads, that sort of undercuts to me that argument. So I have a couple of questions about ancient okay. question. Oh, ancient rules. Yeah. Quick question: In Egypt, 
what happened when the Pharaoh died? Was it the custom to free people? Was this part of them. the ancient world and what happened in the Pharaoh is also now transposed onto the high priest? And maybe that was a kind of a custom. Just say, recently I asked the rabbi who in the ancient world had the power of pardon. You know, we we don't know if the kings had it. We don't know if the uh, Sanhedrin had it. Um, so the I, I think there's just no evidence. Yeah, sort of I, I I can't answer the question of these being Egyptian ancient law, and I don't really know the answer to that piece. They could have picked it up then, and yeah. I think Egyptology. Richard, I'll get to you in a second. Oh, okay. um, I want to go back to undermining the argument about education. How does the appointment of the second high priest and that he didn't pray undermine the argument simply because they're emphasizing that he didn't make prayers and requests? That's A. Right. So B is that right. the second high priest would have at least known it from the high priest and didn't functionally educate anyone about it. Well, but but what else are you adding to no, what, really I, what I'm think saying that is. The, the way I understood the education piece was that if the high priest in office educated the public about not about being really careful and not well, inadvertently well. killing people, then the high priest who was the educator at the time the murder occurred is no longer in the picture. He's he's already dead. So if it was because of his failure then that should have released the guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, And the fact that, that that doesn't release him, I'm saying, seems to me to be a strong argument against the theory that the reason it's the high priest's death is because the high priest was not a good educator. That's well, the only I, point. I, I'm, I'm, not sure that it, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's an argument against that argument. Just like uh -huh. the second high priest is basically blamed for the same thing that the first high priest is blamed for. Even though he wasn't on... In, in that position at the time of the yeah. murder. And any high priest, if you read the prophetic literature, is responsible not only to request Rachamim, not only to pray on behalf of these people, but in my presentation of the possibilities, is also responsible to educate. And since neither of them actually does that work great, then I have even more of a reason to say he's got to wait for the death of this second guy as well. And the challenge might be to, to any of them or both of them, either of them really in this case, to do a little bit of a better job, either using their station as the religious sacred precinct leader or the public educator. I don't think necessarily it totally undermines the argument. It even makes it stronger. Here, here's a possibility. If the priesthood was about teaching someone how to do the avoda, do the sacred work in the precincts, and do the kind of praying that a high priest should, this guy at least has the qualifications to become the high priest for a ritual basis. But there's no reason why we couldn't say that the high priest, the first high priest, didn't pass along the instructions to actually become the educator, the Torah educator that he needed to be. But he didn't do that either. So I'm just completely paralleling that possibility based on some knowledge about what we ask of Kohanim in the prophetic literature. Uh -huh. And no one is really living up to that standard. So that's that's you know just another possible way of looking at it from a different angle. Uh, Richard. You're on mute. Can you be on mute or are you muted? I think you're muted. You're still muted. Yes. Um, now I think um, put this back. I think that there's a conflict here in in understanding the rationale for the the meaning of the death of the high priest. We certainly have this: the priest didn't live up to expectations in terms of of uh, providing the proper safety education, okay? Which is really what you're talking about, because these are all unintentional. 
at deaths that we're talking about, not and premeditated. Not, by the way, I'm not just talking about safety education. I'm talking about sacredness of life. I'm talking yeah. about how you really think about your neighbors, how you take responsibility for them. You know, you don't right. uh, but, leave your you don't just leave your uh, uh, your, 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 your your roof roller hanging on right. the edge. The wind blows. Right. And it's all, okay. But there's another but there's another concept here that's being used. Another word that's being used, which is atonement. Yes. So now we're back to the other thing again. Are we? And you know what's used for atonement. Yom Kippur, you know, the, the, all the sacrifices, these are all yeah. mechanisms, and we're getting awfully close to a Christian, and we're both in time frame and in um and in in theory as to the sacrifice of an, a very important uh priestly figure, in essence, providing atonement. I'm not sure that you're having these cultural connections influencing some of this. Interesting. Just see. Interesting, because if you think about death as, as atoning for sin, right, you can't help, and we haven't brought this totally up because I didn't want to get caught up in the total Christian comparisons yeah. of this time period literature, but it's a good time to do it since we're now dwelling in the death of lots of different Kohanim, right? Death atoning for sin mm. and leaving you to be an innocent in the world again sounds familiar mm -hmm. so i have a whole big piece that we're going to do on it down the line a little bit okay that scholars have noticed so you could say baruch shekivanti this is a very interesting theme that is arising and how we grapple with the idea of death atoning for others this is one of the famous locations, the, 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 the locus of this is the Talmudic literature that is swirling around the same time as early Christian church father literature. And we in different ages as Jews, I'll just say it like this, have either seen death as atoning for self, seen one's own death as atoning for self, another's death as atoning for someone and asking the fundamental question of whether or not that's a kosher way to think and then even leaving certain texts and making the point as opposed to the early church fathers and in the middle ages into the middle ages using gemaras making sure that our main characters don't die the and the the, the death of martyrs on behalf of others or the death of major institutional figures that then mechaper, atone for others. The deaths are called human deaths. They merit olam haba, as opposed to the read of the Jesus figure who dies for you. And this is the big distinction between the Zohar and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's death on a natural causes kind of level and the idea of the Messiah's death and how we play this out over time and, and millennia is still part of the Christian Jewish dialogue. So excellent that you brought up the point here. It'll get us into some other texts. I want to mention at the end here that's 857. So I'm just going to mention one little comment and we're going to stop it here and pick up with a baye the next time. And we're also going to see the next time a little uh, foreshadowing about questions about um, whether or not a Cohen. And this is going to be a really interesting part. Whether or not a Cohen who's found to be an imposter, like what do you do with that? So it's very interesting that we're going to get into questions of imposters and or qualifications or disqualifications down the line. This is going to be a fascinating piece. But um, there's, there's a commentary that says, so what is another aspect of the Cohen's responsibility to build on our, he's got to pray and he's got to be a teacher? The, the Mare Kohen, which is commentary on the Gemara, says that the Kohen should have really deep compassion for those who are um, for those who are on the stand, for those who are suspected of crimes. And how does that compassion come out within a case of manslaughter, an ultimate possibility that someone is going to have to be sentenced to Nidui to exile. 
The Cohen should argue with the judges of the Sanhedrin, 23 of them has to have to be seated for this kind of a case. Says the Mari Cohen, as a commentary, one way that I see this is that the Cohen never lived up to the responsibility of saying, you, you should really come at this really trying to understand the truth of the matter, folks, and you should really ask questions. Don't just sit and let your colleagues ask the questions and be satisfied with their explanations. Really, they've got to ask questions as the judges, like you see the impaneled Supreme, the Court, Supreme Court, right? They got to ask questions. So he says, ask questions. And he said, if it turned out that all 23 justices came to the conclusion that he's totally guilty and there was no doubt, no reasonable doubt in the room and there wasn't a majority minority, then the case should be looked at as really wrong, as a mistrial. Because it shouldn't be unanimous. It just shouldn't be that unanimous with 23 human beings. Now, are there cases that seem cut and dry? You know, the ax head flew off. You know, we have the videotape. Not that they had the videotape, but we, you know, we've got the witness. And it seems like that. But Kamari Cohen's making it a, a point that everybody has to really ask deep questions about the case. They have to be super sure that they're going to really exile this person. And that the Cohen didn't kind of put that into the uh, compassion in the justice system as much as the Cohen could have as a sacred leader. And that should have been a component of what we expect from the high priest when the high priest existed at the same time that the Sanhedrin and, and uh, satellite courts really existed. So that's that's the shear for tonight. Great to see everybody uh, in the Bay Midrash and expanding it to the virtual. Thank you. Have a I great night. Off. There's a simcha tomorrow at Davening. We have, we have an ofruf. If anybody wants to celebrate with Ethan Lowens, uh, it's a great, it's going to be great fun. And see door class for those interested is delayed till 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. All right. Erev Tov. Erev Tov. Erev Tov. Erev Tov. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.